This is the third in a series of lessons on the Holy Bible. As we approach the study of the scriptures, we have thus far tried to show you that the Bible is a very interesting and profitable book, and we have sought to increase your interest in the Bible to the point that you would buy one and study it. In the second lesson, we talked about Jesus Christ, who was the central character of the Bible. In today's lesson, we want to talk to you about priorities. As we discuss priorities, it is important, first of all, to realize that the majority of people in the world still do not have a copy of the Bible in their possession. And for those who do have a copy of the Bible in their possession and in their own language, they have not yet taken the time to read the whole Bible. Of those who have taken the time to read the whole Bible, the majority of them have never studied the whole Bible. And when we study the Bible, we invariably study under someone else's guidance and direction. It is therefore our purpose in this lesson to allow Jesus Christ, whom I believe to be the author of the Bible, to guide us in establishing priorities in the Bible. In a previous lesson, we looked at the Bible library of 66 different books and discovered that five of them were books about law. Now, the Bible is a book that discusses law, but that's not the most important thing in the Bible. We discovered that the Bible also had books of history, of course, there are history books in the Bible, but again, that is not the most important thing in the Bible. We discovered that the Bible has poetry and that the Bible has prophecy. But once again, we shall discover from Jesus Christ, the author of the Bible, that none of these are the most important things in the Bible. Today, in the religious world, we have all sorts of denominations, each with its own particular emphasis, each with its own set of priorities. And of course, the same was true in Jesus' day. The Jewish world of Jesus' day was divided into various sects or denominations like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the Essenes and the Zealots. Now, each of these denominations had its own priority, and they were divided on their understanding of the Scripture, no two of them exactly agreeing on what was the most important. In the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the Scriptures talk about the Pharisees coming to Jesus with a question, and of course it was not a sincere question at all. They were trying to divide and polarize the followers of Jesus. Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 34, records it in these words. And when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law. Now I might inject parenthetically that in addition to the Ten Commandments which were given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Jewish rabbis had cataloged 613 other laws. And they could not decide among themselves which of these many, many laws was the most important. That's why they were divided. And again, I want to stress that their motive in asking Jesus this question was not really to find out, but was, it was to polarize and divide his followers. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If I may refer again to our first 39 books of the Bible, we will discover that all of these books, the law and the prophets, were summarized by Jesus in only two commandments. Now you will recall that from time to time I have made reference to the globe saying that in our overview of the Bible, we're going to try and just back off and get a capsule view of what God has to say. We've had our little puzzle divided into several different parts, but today we're only going to have it in two different parts, one of them representing the vertical relationship which we have with God as we seek to love Him with all of our heart, 
all of our soul and all of our mind, and the second representing our love for our neighbor as we endeavor to love one another in the same way that we would want to be loved. And I hope that during the lesson you will see the Bible come together in a meaningful and consistent way. Now this particular lesson is, a, is of pivotal importance as far as I'm concerned, and I want to tell you why. At the risk of being misunderstood, I would like to read for you from a church history book. This particular history was written by Albert Henry Newman. This is volume two, and it talks about the period of the Reformation following the time when the Bible was available to man in his own vernacular. We learned in a previous lesson that the first printed Bible was in Latin. It was Gutenberg's Bible, but the majority of people in Europe could not read Latin, for Latin was a dead language. In 1522, Martin Luther translated the Bible into the German language, and then in 1523, he translated the Pentateuch. Well, I should go back and correct myself to say that he translated the New Testament scriptures in 1522. In 1523, he translated the Pentateuch. In 1524, he translated the Psalter, and the entire Bible it was not translated into German until the year 1534. But as people began to read the Bible, uh, they began to formulate into different denominations, each with its own priority. Now there were a lot of social grievances which needed to be corrected in Luther's day. I'm going to begin reading now on page 69 of Albert Henry Newman's Manual of Church History. There was a group of people who banded together and called themselves the Evangelical Brotherhood. They were poor people. And the poor people in Martin Luther's day had been grievously oppressed by those who were rich. And as they read from the Bible, they wanted to do something about social injustice, and so they formed themselves into a brotherhood which was called the Evangelical Brotherhood. One of their leaders was a, uh, an individual by the name of Munzer. Now this is the way he exhorted those who were his followers in the Evangelical Brotherhood. He said, on, 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 never mind the wail of the godless, though they beg in friendly tones and though they cry and whimper like children, pity not. Was it not thus that God commanded his people to slay the Canaanites? On, on, while the fire is hot, down with the castles and their inmates. God is with you, on. On. Unfortunately, Martin Luther did not agree with Munzer in his approach to the scripture, and he was allied with those who lived in castles, who happened to be wealthy individuals whom Munzer thought were oppressing the poor. So Martin Luther responded to the challenge of Munzer by encouraging his followers to go out and fight with the peasants. He said that they should be crushed strangled, stabbed, privately and publicly by whomsoever can do it, just as one would beat to death a mad dog. The magistrate that falters commits sin, since it does not satisfy the peasants to belong to the devil themselves, but they constrain many pious people to their wickedness and damnation. Therefore, dear sirs, fire here, save here, stab, smite, strangle them, whoever can. If your death result very well, you can never attain to a more blessed death. Leonard Fries, who was a witness to the struggle which took place in Germany in the year 1524, said that there were 100,000 fatalities in 10 weeks time alone. That was the Peasants' War of 1524, and it was fought between two warring factions in Christendom, both of them claiming to read the Bible. In today's lesson, we want to keep stressing the fact that Jesus, who was the author of the Bible, said it is not a book about war, though there are some stories about war in the Bible. It is not a book about vengeance. It is primarily a book about love. The first and most important commandment in all the Bible is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. These are overlapping, redundant expressions. The Bible word for heart includes man in his entirety. We think with our heart. Proverbs 23, 7 declares, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. We will with our heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the scriptures teach every man according as he purposeth in his heart, 
so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. We have emotions in our heart. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so when the scriptures teach that we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind, it is simply emphasizing over and over again the fact that we must love God in our entirety. Our soul is our entire self. Our mind represents our entire strength, both physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. And that's the way we have to love God. But it's not enough just to love God. We must also love our neighbor in the same way that we would want to be loved. Jesus phrased it like this on the night of his betrayal, as he said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. He also said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And all of those expressions were made by Jesus at a very critical time in his ministry as he was seeking to impress upon his followers his priorities. And as you study the Bible, I want you to see more than anything else that the Bible is basically a book about love. Now again, at the risk of being misunderstood, let me emphasize the fact that for the next 124 years, the factions of Christendom in Europe fought one with another in an indescribable way. There was the war between the emperor and the king of France. And then there was a decision which was reached by the Duke of Braunschweig that the accursed sect of the Lutherans must be destroyed. Then there was the Diet of Spear in 1526 in which it was decided that whoever owned the territory also owned the people who lived on that territory. Then there was the sacking of Rome and the imprisonment of the Pope in 1527 when Frunsberg determined that he was not only going to go to Rome and arrest the Pope, but that he was going to hang him. 4,000 people unfortunately lost their lives. Then there was the second war between the emperor and the king of France from 1527 to 1529. And then there were the Capel Wars of 1529 to 1531. And then there was the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day where 70,000 Protestant people were butchered in a single night on the streets of Paris. And then there were, there were just wars, indescribable wars for 124 years. The last great war was the Thirty Years' War. It began in the year 1618 and lasted until the year 1648. I want to quote to you now from page 410 regarding the destruction of the Thirty Years' War. And again, I must emphasize it was fought between various factions of Christendom who were all studying the Bible. The extent of the destruction of life through the Thirty Years' War cannot be estimated. If we take into account the multitudes who died of starvation and exposure, the hundreds of thousands of women and children who were slain in the sacking and destroying of towns and cities, the fearful waste of life that must have been involved in camp following, and deaths caused by the war, it would amount to many millions. In Bohemia, for example, at the beginning of the war, there was a population of two million, of whom about eight-tenths were Protestant. At the close of the war, there were about 800,000 Catholics and no Protestants. Taking Germany and Austria together, we may safely say that the population was reduced by one-half, if not by two-thirds. And the deaths were, in most cases, the result of untold sufferings, and as horrible as we can conceive. So far as the cities and towns that were not utterly destroyed, they were merely shadows of what they had been. Their buildings were dilapidated and large numbers were unoccupied. Business of all kinds had been almost entirely destroyed. Agriculture had equally suffered. Livestock was almost completely exterminated. Farming implements were scarce and rude. Desolation was everywhere. It was at this juncture in history that the various factions of Christen decided that they were going to have to establish peace, though they didn't understand one another, those are, though their views of the Bible were decidedly different from those of their neighbors. They determined that there must be peace for the survival of mankind and the progress of the Christian movement. It is in this vein that I speak to you today. The Bible is not a book about war. It is not a book just about judgment or justice. It is primarily a book about love. And if you will take Jesus Christ seriously, you will find the Bible coming into perspective 
just as we look at the globe and see immediately something about its continents and something about its oceans. I want you to come to the place where you can take the Bible and instead of being confused and bewildered by all the various stories and all the different teachings of the Bible, you will remember that the author of the Bible, whose spirit inspired all the various prophets to write, said, it's really basically a very simple book. Jesus has been described as the master of one-syllable words, an individual who walked about in sandals, and the common people heard him gladly. He said, really, the Bible is a very simple book. The first and most important thing in the Bible is that you must love God in the proper way. You must establish a relationship with the creator of the universe. And, of course, I must again emphasize the fact that Jesus was himself God. A word is a vehicle of communication, and Jesus was the word of God. The Bible teaches in the beginning it was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Then in the 14th verse of John chapter 1, the Scriptures teach the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word of God. His name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead in a body. 1 Timothy 3.16 says he is God manifest in the flesh. And so the author of the Bible and God manifest in the flesh said, as you read through the Bible, remember that the first and most important thing in the Bible is that you must love God in the right way, but that's not the only commandment. Similar to it, like it, is the second great commandment, which involves a horizontal relationship involving our fellow men. And we are to love one another in the same way that we would want to be loved. And the author of the Bible said, on these two commandments, everything that Moses taught, Everything that the prophets wrote can be summarized. Now, to show you that this is an all-pervasive principle, let me quote from 1 John chapter 3. This is the message that we have heard from the beginning. Now, from what beginning? From the beginning of the church? No. From the beginning of Moses' law? No. But from the beginning of everything. This is the message that we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another and not be like Cain who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Cain loved God. He went through all of the rituals of religion, but he didn't love his brother. And so from the very beginning, God was always trying to tell us that loving him was not enough. It wasn't enough just to read the Bible in the days of Martin Luther. People were supposed to love in those days, but they forgot about that love. And I think that's the crying need of our day. Not just that we love God, but that we also have compassion with one another. You know, I really feel awkward about this because I normally teach in a way that I can establish a dialogue with our listeners. And as I look into the camera, I don't know to whom I'm talking, and I really can't hear you ask me anything. But I'm going to anticipate that some of you are very actively involved in Christianity and you go to a church that has a different kind of an emphasis than love. You may be emphasizing sanctification. That's a wonderful Bible doctrine and the scriptures teach that we need to follow after sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. But there's something more important in the Bible than sanctification. You may be in a church which emphasizes some type of church government or some particular aspect of the clergy. Well, that may be a very important thing to emphasize, but it's not the most important thing. Don't you remember in the first Corinthian letter, there was a church that had all sorts of problems. They had the problem of division, the problem of immorality. They had the problem of brethren going to court with other brethren. They had problems over marriage. They had problems over idolatry. They had problems over positions of women in the church. They had problems over the Lord's Supper. They had problems over charismatic gifts. And Paul said, I'm going to show you something that's more important than anything else I've taught you. And he taught them about love. He said that love was patient and kind. And I think at the risk of um, doing violence to 1 Corinthians 13, I just want to substitute the word Jesus instead of love or charity in 1 Corinthians 13 because Jesus personified love. God is love and Jesus is God. 
And so it is correct to say that love suffers long and is kind, but it's also correct to say that Jesus suffered long and was kind. Jesus suffered long and was kind. Jesus envied not. Jesus vaunted not himself, and Jesus was not puffed up. Jesus did not behave himself unseemly. Jesus did not seek his own way. Jesus was not easily provoked. Jesus took not account of evil. Jesus rejoiced not in unrighteousness, but Jesus rejoiced with truth. Jesus would bear all things and believe all things and hope all things and endure all things. Jesus would never fail. But perhaps that message is too simple for some of you to accept. Let me share with you one of the most dramatic and moving stories that I have ever read. I found it in a book by Morton Thompson, which was called The Cry and the Covenant. It's a story of a Hungarian doctor by the name of Ignaz Philip Semmelweis. In the day when he practiced medicine, way back in the 1800s, one out of every six women who gave birth to a child died in childbirth. The culprit that killed them was called puerperal fever, or childbed fever, and it was a direct result of uncleanliness on the part of those physicians. They began their day early in the morning by making autopsies on those who had died during the preceding 24 hours, and then without ever washing their hands, they would go into the maternity ward and make pelvic examinations upon expectant mothers. Dr. Simmelweis began to make an association between the pelvic examinations and the fatal infections. He had heard about an innovative solution called chlorine, and in the ward of the hospital where he was in charge, he put a basin of a chlorine solution and demanded that everyone who entered into the ward wash in the chlorine solution. Well, there was a dramatic improvement, and women did not die as much as they had been dying. But in one ward, there were 12 patients and 11 fatalities. So Dr. Simmelweis became more stringent in his admonitions to hygiene and demanded that the doctors wash after every examination. Now, the fact that the death rate improved didn't help Dr. Simmelweis because the people had never really thought much about personal hygiene, and so he lost his job. He couldn't get another job in Vienna, so he went to his home in Budapest. He got a job in the hospital. He brought in his chlorine solution. The death rate improved as far as fatalities among expectant mothers, but again, he lost his job. So he opened his own clinic. According to the statistics, which were available in the book, he delivered 8,537 babies and lost only 184 mothers. Now, that's a statistic which rivals our own day and age. But again, no one believed him. He put down these various statistics and all of the information available in a book which he wrote titled The Etiology, the Concept, and the Pro uh, Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever, but still no one believed him. On June the 15th, 1848, he lectured for the third time before a medical society in Europe. Here are his words. I have now shown on three occasions before this body that puerperal fever is caused by decomposed material conveyed to a wound. I have shown that it is a pyemia, a pus in the blood. I have shown that a man can infect a woman with this pyemia, and that a man can infect another man with it. That is the way Dr. Kolechka died. I have shown that it can arise after surgery as well as after childbirth, and that it can arise in the non-pregnant as well as the pregnant. I have shown that it can be prevented, and I have shown how that it can be prevented. I have proved all that I have said with facts, with records, and with laboratory experiments, and with human beings. I've talked a great deal. But while we talk and talk, gentlemen, women are dying, and doctors are killing them. There is no lying in hospital where women are not dying of childbed fever and their children with them. And we talk, gentlemen. We talk, and we talk, and we talk, and it isn't necessary to talk. I am not asking anything world-shaking. I am asking only that you wash. In the name of pity, stop the murder of mothers. Gentlemen, wash your hands. Wash everything that contacts a patient. Stop this murder. For God's sake, wash your hands. They wouldn't do it. The last thing he did before they locked him up in an asylum was print this material up for the public to
to read. Like a madman, he went out on the streets, passing out these leaflets. Then he went into the autopsy room where a body was decomposing as they were performing an autopsy. He took the scalpel in his hand and he slashed the abdomen of that corpse and then he slashed his own finger. He rubbed the raw wound of his own hand in the decomposed material of a dead person and they led him away to an insane asylum. He died there a few weeks later his hand was almost rotted off and the death rattle of a thousand women were ringing in his ears. His solution to the problem of puerperal fever was too simple. Before he died, he wrote these words. When I, with my present convictions, look upon the past, I can only dispel the sadness which falls upon me by gazing into the happy future when we're in the lying in hospitals and also outside of them, throughout the whole world, child bed fever will be no more. But, but if, if it is not vouchsafed me to look upon that happy time with my own eyes, from which misfortune may God preserve me, the conviction that such a time must inevitably sooner or later arrive will cheer my dying hour. I would like to conclude this lesson by saying that I feel these same thoughts are applicable to the Christian world and to the message of love. We live in a troubled world with war and famine and pestilence and hatred. And I am convinced that God has the solution to our problems written down in the Holy Bible, a book about love, but unfortunately, a book which has been drastically misunderstood by the majority of people in the world.